Th thank you so much, Charlie. And, uh, you know, Char WCN is where it is today because of Charlie Knowles. Don't anybody fool you that. That's what it is. I have to take a page out of Charlie's book. How many people knew what, didn't know what a copy was so they came to this talk? <laughs> All right, there's a good number here. So that's, that's important. We talk, have to talk a little bit about their biology because it's such a unique animal. Uh, I was drawn to, we have to get our slide up here. I was drawn to work with Okapi uh, many years ago because at that time they were very unknown and, and not much was done. There was no conservation for the animal and it was very little interest in conserving it, but it does serve as the flagship species, one of the most important ecosystems on the face of the earth. Uh, where we work is in the Democratic Republic Congo, was Zaire, before that was a Belgian Congo, has a horrific history of abuse of the people and it goes on and, it, and they're still suffering the aftermath of all that abuse over time. If you see the location, it, the cop you're found in the heart of Africa, it really is the center of Africa. The last large mammal discovered because of its location. It was a very impenetrable forest, mountains, rivers, the Nile, the Congo. It took explorers a long time to get to this area and then there was a lot of uh, dangerous tribes that lived in this area. This country is one of the richest in resources in the world and one of the poorest for the, the lives that people live. It has over uh, $23 trillion worth of minerals estimated in the ground of Eastern Congo. So this is where coltan comes from, cobalt, gold, diamonds, uranium. It's a tremendously important country for resources. So it is the most biodiverse country in Africa. It has more species of birds, mammals, reptiles, than any other place on the planet. It is uh, considered uh, by Conservation International one of the 17 mega diversity countries in Africa, but also has a lot of endemic species like okapi and mountain I mean, uh, uh, bonobos and certain types of other species are only found in this ecosystem. This is a rainforest. Rainforest has two words, rain and forest. People forget about the water part. It rains a lot, there's raging rivers, there's water flowing everywhere, and there's trees. And this is the environment that the okapi lives in. This is the, uh, it has 70% of the tropical forest in Africa, 13% of the tropical forest in the world. These are the lungs of Africa. This is where the oxygen is produced for most of the people that live in that continent. The water, there, there's no desert in Congo. Every bit of land is arable. You can grow something any place because of all the water. It's a closed canopy. Uh, forest. This is where Okapi live. Very little light hits the ground. There's a whole other world looking underneath the canopy than in the canopy. This is a, the world the Okapi lives in. And if you want to conserve Okapi, you got to make sure all those plants are all around them. They eat over 100 different species of leaves, of plants. They have to have this environment to survive. And a lot, they, eat, they have to eat leaves uh, on a regular basis because a lot of leaves are toxic. If you eat too many of one leaves, they get sick. They have to move on to another species. Okapi are big animals. You know, I always wonder why okapi are so big. The males are 600, a female 600, 800 pounds. The males are five, six. Most forest species are small to go through the hairbrush. But they have to walk through the very thick jungle. They have to push their way through. When I was with a bunch of pygmies and they're going through the forest and I can't go anywhere because I'm hitting everything. And I'm about the same height as an okapi. Now I said, that's why okapi are so big and strong because they have to push through. I was too weak to go through. I have to have the pygmies take a machete and cut me a hole through the forest. So. If people ask, why are the okapi colored like they are? What's their coloration coat? Watch this okapi go 15 feet from the camera and it's going to stop and, and, and eat. And it just disappears into the forest. So the light coming through the forest, the stripes, the color, it get, makes them really just blend in totally. So that even though you may be close to an okapi, you'll never see the okapi. Okapi uh, uh, are preyed upon by leopards and they have coexisted for millions of years together in the forest. So the leopard drives the biology of the okapi. The okapi, they attack adults. This is an adult okapi with leopard scars on its rump. You can see right here. And the adults are big enough to rub the, uh, the leopard off their back by just running through the underbrush, put their head down, and they just scrape the leopard off their back. <laughs> but the babies and young are perfect prey for leopards. To counter leopard predation, the babies are born, they get into a nest, they stay there for about two months. They don't defecate for 60 days to give any scent. Their mother will not go near them. She will call them to come out and nurse. The baby goes back and lays down. 
They produce a very high fat milk. They grow very quickly. So they get up to a size by six or seven months. They're about almost a size too big for a leopard to hunt. So it's a very unique biology. It's all based on the predation of leopards. This is an infrasound recording of infrasound okapi talking to another okapi. This is boosted by NASA to our hearing range. It's below our hearing range. So okapi are talking to the mother's talking to the baby. Baby's talking to the mother. Females are talking to males. And this sound goes through the forest quite a long distance. That's how the okapi communicate in this very thick environment. And it's very, very, elephants use this, and black rhinos are also known to use this. In very thick environments, animals want to communicate. That's how they do it. So okapi have been living in this forest untouched for six to seven million years same species and it wasn't until 1901 that they were discovered and right after that they were to capture them and put them in and kill them and put them in a museum this is a museum in paris every natural history museum had to have an okapi this was the unicorn of africa the mysterious animal never knew about we have to exhibit it and the next phase was live animals so in apulu where our base is now, the Belgians set up a, a station for okapi that supplied uh, the zoos. Main, the first okapi went to Antwerp Zoo in 1919, and the first birth in a zoo in, was in Antwerp in 1957. So the okapi population in zoos around the world is about 200 animals, but they are ambassadors for us now. They're very important because people see an okapi in a zoo and they say, what is a wonderful animal? And th there's no way you can see these animals in a wild for a number of various reasons. Uh, we, took a pro the project on in uh, 1987 with, with uh, the contract with the government of Zaire at the time to rebuild this uh, uh, Pulu station and to put a place where the people of the Congo could see their national animal. This is a national animal protected since 1933. There was no way the people of the Congo would see this animal, no place. So at this time, Okapi were not endangered. They were not threatened. They were very numerous throughout the forest. So that's when we started this program in Apulu. Our, our base is right here on the Apulu River. This is the Trans-African Highway, a one-lane dirt road. Goes right through there, right through the middle of the reserve. And that's uh, where we operate from. Uh, the Okapi is important uh, in Congo, much more it is to us here. It is a symbol of their national parks. This is a, the patch from the, the rangers that protect the protected areas. It's a symbol of all the areas. Everybody knows when Okapi is in Congo, and there's a lot of pride around this animal. So we base our, everybody knows an Okapi. Radio Okapi is the number one news source in Congo. It has radio, internet, everything. So then also the stamps, there's water, there's, there's Okapi cigarettes, there's Okapi logistics. You go into Kinshasa, everything's named Okapi. So it's people, every two-year-old, unlike you, would know what an Okapi is in the Congo. So we based our, our work on the government that this is a very important animal. There was no protected area. So as Charlie mentioned, in uh, 1992, the Okapi Wildlife Reserve was created. Uh, it's a very expansive rainforest, and then it was a uh, United Nations World Heritage Site in 1996, as you can see. Not only were Okapi there, but there's also a cultural reserve. The Mbuti Pygmies also live in this reserve and share the habitat with the Okapi. It has the most, most uh, chimpanzees, most ele forest elephants, most okapi, and large numbers of other forest ungulates live in the reserve. The Mbuti pygmies share the oak land for about 40,000 years they've existed in the, this area. Now, they are the smallest people on earth. The men are four feet uh, eight inches tall, the women about four feet three inches tall. They're net hunters. They use, this is a rolled up net, and their dog, and they will string this uh, think this net through the forest and they would catch the okapi, uh, the, not the okapi, okapi are too big for these nets, I'm sorry, but a dikers, small mammals, that's what their main for source of food is. And they use the leaves in the forest to build their houses, do everything. To protecting the okapi wildlife reserve are the rangers. The rangers are, are employed by the government, but there's no money to pay them. So we've been supporting them since the incursion, and their idea is their role and job is to protect uh, the, the resources of the forest, the wildlife, and uh, all the natural resources, and they do this in, in a number of ways. We support the rangers, base pay, food rations, health care for their families, communication. It's a very difficult job. As Charlie's saying, this is an area active with uh, legal militias. Uh, it's a very dangerous job. They have to be prepared, and it's, uh, it's uh, work that, uh, without our support, would not be going on. We provide the infrastructure. This is a new office we built in, a, in immigration 
uh, in the Zungaluka guard post. But this one, this, this is an important thing. This is a, a bowl of checkpoint. You wash your hands, you get out and get temperature taken. I was just there, had my uh, bowl of checked about 20, 25 times. Uh, every time you go to a village, you got to get out, wash your hands, check your temperature. They're very concerned. Well, bowl is very close to the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, and uh, the, the Doctors Without Borders is doing a fantastic job there, unbelievable job, uh, World Health Organization controlling this activity. So elephants are really a problem. They're so cute and wonderful, but they draw in all kinds of bad people. The price of ivory rising up has drawn in lots of poachers and gangs into the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. As you can see, in the, one of the issues with forest elephants is their ivory is denser than savanna elephants. It's more valuable, and so the forest elephants are sought after from the, by the poachers, and so it's a very difficult, challenging thing. And one of the ways to protect elephants and other animals is being the patrol. Our, the rangers walk between 20,000 and 25,000 kilometers a year through the forest, picking up snares, arresting poachers, and breaking up different mining camps. Uh, Okapi are occasionally caught in snares, so that's why it's important that we always put, in, incidentally caught for bushmeat snaring, so we, we push the rangers to collect as many snares as possible. Another threat is mining. This area has gold, uh, and during Mobutu's rule, this was a mining area. No people were allowed because it was known to be a lot of gold in this area. So gold, not only mining, but only not destroys the, uh, the habitat, but also it disturbs the animals. They move out, and also it pollutes the waterway. So it's a very uh, disturbing thing to happen, and closing the mines is very important. But the most del deleterious effect of mining is the people that come to the mine have to eat and they depend on bush meat to supply themselves in the mines. These villages pop up around a, a gold mine, and the, there is a number of people that just come in for traders, but they all have to eat. And we, we, the, one of the favorite bush meat species are primates. This is a red colobus monkey, but this is the densest uh, primate population in all of Africa. 17 different species of primates live here, so this is the number one target for the bush meat is the primates. Uh, what we have done and worked at over the next last four years, 15,000 miners have been evacuated, and it's a really drop in bushmeat consumption and use if you get the miners out. So it's really important we close these mines, not only to stop the mining, but also to stop the bushmeat trade. It's a really important thing to do. This is just some of the things that we, the rangers had done last year, but I think what's important is they, this, they covered 9,000 more kilometers in 2018, they did in 2017. And that's because we had a real important push on them. We hired 50 new rangers, and we're just trying to get as many people out on the ground as possible. Okapi, you see the signs of Okapi? They have, there are Okapi signs. They record them when they're going through the forest. The, the other pillar is our community work. Protection is one thing. It saves the environment. It keeps private people out. But there's 50,000 people living around this reserve that use resources. So educating them, if you're not just addressing the areas of poverty, health, and sustainable living, we're not going to be successful. We're just keeping the protection up year after year is expensive. One thing, that, if we can have allies around the reserve helping us, it would be much easier. There are 226 villages, 50,000 people that need to be reached with a conservation message. We have to have them to be our allies. We have to want them to support the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. Getting around is not easy. It's a very difficult road situation. Our educators travel on motorcycle all around the rural reserve on a regular basis to meet with all the villages. And our main goal here is reaching the children. The children are the future, and they are what we our educators call message multipliers. A lot of the parents are illiterate, they can't read, the kids come home from school or from meeting with our educators and they talk about what they, they talk about forests, they talk about biodiversity, they talk about okapi, they talk about things they hear from our educators, and there's no radio, there's no TV, so the family conversations are the source of information sharing. So the kids are the, really our most important vehicle to get the message home to a lot of the parents. There's a, about uh, 37,000 school children are reached by our educator two to three times a year. They go to every village and meet with the kids. They talk to kids. We give out school supplies. We try to work with the different teachers. We have a curriculum we develop for conservation that every school in this region uses. Every school uses our concrete curriculum, so it's really important to get the message to the kids. The Okapi Wildlife Reserve 
is a reserve, not a national park. No people were moved out to create this reserve. People are here. So one way to allow for the people to live sustainably and maintain their traditional lifestyle is to set up zoning. So we have zoning, and the tan is the Mbuti hunting areas where they can hunt legally. And the little white stuff, these are agricultural zones around the reserve where people can grow food, they can be, live off their food. You cannot have people live there with no way to feed themselves or take care of themselves. And then also expect them to leave the wildlife alone. So this is uh, Chief Zaire. When I first came to the project in 1987, there was four Mbuti chiefs. They were very important, had traditional knowledge beyond belief what they knew. They were there, you know, someone were there when the Belgians were there. They remember everything that happened. And this is the last one. And Chief Sire is very active. He walks every day. He's, I, I guess he's in his 70s, maybe he's 80. He's, nobody knows how old they are. He walks six kilometers every day to come to the station, to talk to the warden, to talk to the rangers. He's a big advocate for the indigenous rights, for his own people, to make sure they're respected. And we work very closely with him and his people because this, they have rights. This is, this is their reserve as well for all copies. We want to make sure the pygmies uh, and the Mbuti, it can, they can live the way they want and they can sustainably live off the land like they have for thousands of years. One way we have to educate the Mbuti is there is protected species. We have created these posters and we go village to village to meet with all the Mbuti to tell them which animals they cannot hunt. There's a lot of animals they can hunt, which is legal for them to eat, but there are certain animals, as you see in this poster, are all protected. And that's, it's a good educational, and there's not any resistance to that. Just them knowing is a big thing. There's plenty of species that they can hunt that are very more numerous than these animals here. So. The agricultural zones are very important because they set the limits between forest and agriculture. The number one threat to Okapi, everything else I talk to you about, number one threat is slash and burn agriculture. No forest, no Okapi. It's a simple equation. There's nothing more diff easy than that. So we keep, we have these zones. The farmers stay inside the zone and the forest is over here. It works really well. They design these, these uh, agricultural zones. We work with them. We teach them how to grow food more efficiently. And it's actually been working. We've only had one break in the agricultural zone since we started the project. And it was a two hectare intrusion into the forest. It's only two hectares. So it's amazing that the people are, are working and policing themselves on this. But helping them grow foods and more sustainably and more efficiently is what we try to do through our agroforestry program. We have uh, five nurseries around the reserve that produce trees for the farmers, nut, fruit, native trees, rainforest trees, and they're distributed to farmers around the region. Uh, this is uh, Therese Benguetto, the woman that runs our nursery in Wamba. We also grow different types of crops for the people who can uh, have new, new food, it's better and more nutritious food, so we work with them on that issue. And the, the kids plant trees around the school. Every school is in a clearing, and it's 10 degrees hotter, and the kids are in the classroom, and it's really hot. Planting trees around the school, they water them, you get shade, and there's a big, huge difference in the, in the learning environment in the schools. All the kids plant the trees around their schools, and they're very active, and this is very important. So we planted almost 70,000 trees last year. Our goal is to get to 100,000 trees, we'll build one more nursery, that's a lot of trees. That's helping a lot of forests and it helps a lot of people. So it's really one of our best programs, we really think. And the people love this because the trees really help produce food and things that they can eat sustainably. Uh, we have a lot of farming programs and uh, women are very involved in this and the women are the key to sustainable rain, uh, resource use. They are responsible for feeding the family. They're responsible for getting the water. They are responsible for getting the firewood. So if you don't address the needs of women and work with women, you're not gonna be successful. So I'm gonna turn it over now to, to Lucas Mears, our program officer, to, to talk about our program for women and also our camera trap program, and he'll explain that to you. Lucas. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Fantastic. So uh, women are probably the most important demographic for our work to protect the Okapi's habitat in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And this is because they, are the, they use the most resources in the forest because they are the food collectors. They do collect the firewood, the clean water, and they also uh, have to take care of all the families. 
And so this is a typical woman in Congo uh, and her 10 children. Um, she has these children to actually help her with all of these job duties. Uh, one child to help collect the food, one to help collect the water, one to help take care of the other kids, one to collect the firewood. And so she needs a, a lot of uh, kids to help um, do all of these duties. And so clean water is one of the, if not the most important uh, request from all of these women. Um, and so by providing clean water sources, uh, it allows them to uh, shorten their wait time, it reduces disease risk, um, and also it improves the health of their, their families. Um, prior to the restoration of these water sources, in 2017 we restored 12 water sources in and around the reserve. Um, the, the water flow was very poor. It was trickling out. Uh, wait times to fill up the, the buckets of water would be three to four hours. Uh, it was an incredibly long time. They were dirty. Um, they were disease-ridden. And so by um, renovating these, we actually allowed um, or reduced the wait time significantly so they could devote those time, that time to other, other interests. And so after the creation and restoration of these 12 uh, water sources, we provided clean water access to over 8,000 women and children uh, throughout the reserve. In addition to clean water, healthcare is a major issue. Um, and so what we do is we actually run a clinic in Apulu uh, with uh, nurses, and we actually provide all the mattresses for the maternity wards, um, all the antibiotics, all the medical supplies, anything that they would need um, to actually uh, uh, take care of their families. And we also pay for the health care for the rangers and all of our, our staff that, are, that uh, get sick as well. And so when we address these basic needs that they, uh, er, that they need, um, water, clean water, um, uh, health care, we address all of that, but we also want to uh, encourage them to explore their goals and aspirations, and that's where we create uh, micro enterprises. And so throughout the reserve, we have five women's groups strategically located in different uh, parts around the reserve. And the, the strategy behind these women's groups is actually to provide them a place where they can get together, collectively work on projects that they could actually sell into, in the local markets. So we provide them with fabric, thread, needles, sewing machines, um, anything that they would need to actually be able to make things to sell into the local village. And then when they sell the items, they take that money and it goes into a collective pot. Um, and at any point in time, if one of the, the women runs into an issue, a shortage of funds, they can call upon that pot in order to um, help pay for any food costs. If they have an injured or sick uh, family member, it can be used to uh, pay for health care. And also um, education expenses, or if they have to make any renovations on their house, if it was destroyed in a storm. But the most important component and most important part of this is that the husbands cannot actually access the money. Um, <laughs> yes. It's for the women. Um, and so by providing this, it gives them a much stronger voice in the community. And that's what we're really going for here. Um, because they are the primary users of the forest resources, we want to provide these opportunities for them and give them opportunities to um, bring in their own money and actually give them a big voice. And that also helps our cause as well. Um, and they become much better stewards of their environment and protecting the rainforest. And that's what we're really, really wanting to go for here. This is Karen Makongo. Um, she is the leader of the women's group in Mombasa, the last slide that you just saw. That's Mombasa, M-A-M-B-A-S-A, -A -A, not to be confused with Mombasa in Kenya. Um, this is a, a big city just right outside of the reserve. And Karen is the leader and educator of these women group, women's groups. So she coordinates all the logistics, she does all the planning, she gets them all together. The women meet once or twice a week, um, but she is, so motivated, talented, she saw that there was a need to create another women's group in Mungberry, about 125 miles north of Mombasa. And so she took the initiative, she created this uh, extra women's group, um, and she actually travels back and forth between Mombasa and Mungberry on motorbike over this 125 mile journey, um, once or twice a month. Um, she's riding a motorbike, um, going through that treacherous road, through those those big walls, um, and that's pretty much uh, unheard of for a woman to be traveling. It takes about two days to actually travel the 125 miles, so what would actually take 
two hours, I don't know about San Francisco traffic, um, what would normally, what should take two hours if you're going 70 miles an hour uh, to get from Mombasa to Mungberry, it actually takes her two days. So she actually has to spend the night in a, a village halfway through. And so when I was over there, I had the opportunity to um, meet with Karin and, uh, and the women's groups, and I am a fan of bow ties. Um, I can make my own. I made this one on Tuesday for this presentation. Um, and so <laughs> I was meeting with them, talking about their needs and what, what, their, what their goals are, what they want to uh, do. Um, and so I kind of asked, can I try it? Because um, I've never actually tried a hand crank sewing machine. My mom had one of the foot pedal ones, um, the wrought iron foot pedal ones. And so I tried it. Um, it was much more difficult than I expected. We're coming down here. Messing <laughs> <laughs> up their meeting. <laughs> I like to think they were impressed by my talent of sewing, but I think I think they were more impressed or curious on the whole breaking gender stereotypes because the men do not sew in Congo. <laughs> so if you noticed, um, the past few slides, we were all sitting outside under a tree. And so that's typically how the, the women's group would meet. They would meet under a tree. If it rained, they would have to cancel their meeting. They couldn't work. Um, so they wanted a, a covered space to do all of their work and store all their materials. So thanks to a generous WCN donor, we were able to construct this gorgeous building where they can actually work in a covered space. They can store all of their materials um, without fear of it getting stolen or wet or ruined from weather. And then it's also a multi-purpose building because our education team can meet there and our agroforestry program can actually store a lot of seeds to distribute throughout the, the um, Mombasa area. And so a few months ago, we actually had the grand opening and John so gracefully captured this video. This is Karin on the left. <laughs> so the cre the <laughs> the construction of the building was a resounding success. The women are so happy; they enjoy it. They have a covered space to work in. They can still meet, um, and so we look to actually um, build these in the four other villages and towns where we have these women's groups, so we can have the, the same experience. Because word has spread, and now the other four are a little jealous. So John has talked about uh, protection, uh, how we work with the rangers to protect the okapi and the, the forest resources, um, agroforestry program, how we work with farmers and the local school children to plant trees and how the women actually um, uh, do some of the gardening, um, conservation education, and then I talked a little bit about the women's groups. So how do we know it's actually working? How do we know what we're doing is actually protecting okapi? What we do is actually provide census. This is actually a photo from um, one of the, the rangers actually capturing it when they saw it in the um, patrol. But we actually do fecal censuses um, because you don't ever see okapi in the wild. So this is the only reliable estimate at this time on uh, okapi um, population numbers within the reserve. And we estimate that it's about three to 4,000 uh, okapi, uh, which is a, a stable population. We consider it to be stable, and it's the highest density of okapi throughout their entire range. We estimate there to be about 10 to 15 throughout their entire range, with three to 4,000 of them in the, in the okapi wildlife reserve. The most recent census was actually uh, done by Wildlife Conservation Society, one of our on-the-ground partners. And they conducted the census in uh, 2017. But because uh, fecal census of okapi aren't necessarily that reliable, we wanted to explore uh, camera trapping, especially around uh, local villages and where people are actually living. And so we took uh, camera traps over there in 2016, and every time we go over, we bring a few more. Um, and so we provided training, and uh, we have a team, uh, we call it Team Okapi, because everything is named after Okapi in the Congo. Um, it's a group of ICC and Rangers, uh, OCP staff members, and um, uh, oh, Mabuti Pygmies as um, 
tour guides um, that actually guide us through, through the forest. And here's John training the group how to actually use, um, use the cameras. And when we go out into the forest, we, we look for signs of animals, and that kind of designates where we're actually going to put these. So this is in November when I went on a uh, camera trap expedition with our group, but just a one-day expedition a few kilometers uh, east of Apulu, and we saw leopard tracks on the road. So we said, this is perfect. Let's go here. And so we went into the forest. Um, we had all of the approvals from ICCN. We met with the local village chief um, because we wanted to get his blessing to actually go into his forest. Um, so we got permission from him. We went into the forest. We followed the GPS coordinate to the first camera trap. Um, we got to the trap and the lock, the key wasn't working for the lock. And I'm like, okay, it's just rusted open. So we sprayed some WD-40 on it. Um, that didn't work. And so I was like, okay, well, I have to get this SD card out of here to switch it. So I tried to break the lock, didn't work. I ended up breaking the camera. Um, so I just took the camera. I brought some extra cameras, so I just replaced the camera and switched it out. Then we go to the second camera. Key didn't work. So I, instead of breaking the lock, I just took the camera off and then um, put the other camera on. Third camera, same thing. I'm starting to think, what is going on? Um, are these all rusting? Is it coincidence? And I'm always, uh, I always give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, we got to the fourth camera, same thing. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? We had the wrong keys to the camera traps. So we had to call off the expedition, go walk all the way back to the truck, go back to Apulu, come back the next day. But it was all worth it um, because then we actually um, uh, was able, were able to actually collect a bunch of fantastic video footage um, that I will show later on in the presentation. And so this is a, a pygmy woman um, with, her, with her child. And so every few weeks, we actually have the pygmies go out every um, two to three weeks to check on all the camera traps. And she's actually communicating with someone off camera, explaining how a camera trap works. So she's explaining to someone else, another pygmy, how the camera trap actually works. Um, and so it's that, that connection and communication with all of the pygmies to that, um, that really helps convey the information and really um, excites them, especially when we show them the videos of the okapi that we, that we collect. And so I'm going to go through a few of the uh, camera trap videos that we have collected over the years. Um, here is a female okapi. She's walking in front of the camera. Doo, 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 doo. And then five minutes later, a male is following her. So okapi are solitary. They, are, they, are, they only come together to come together for two reasons. And one, that's to mate. And two, if it's a mother calf pair. So here we're excited that a male is actually following a female. Now we have a pregnant okapi. You can see her, her stomach is a little distended there. And she is about to pop. And so we suspect that she gave birth uh, just a few days or maybe a week or two after this video was collected. And then what comes after a pregnant okapi? Yes. Aww. And so this is the first footage of a baby okapi ever collected in the wild. I just wish the camera was lower. <laughs> um, and that was the same female in the, in the, the video. But we also collect Leopards. And we suspect this is the same leopard that actually left those tracks because this is a camera from that same area. And then we collect elephants. Uh, yes, this is at night. Mm -hmm. These are infrared cameras, so if it's anything at night, then it's black and white. If it's in full color, there's a baby. If it's in full color, then it's during the day. And so this is Timo Kapi, with me added. Um, 
And so uh, that was a very successful day. That was after the, this was the second day. So we were very happy that we successfully changed the SD cards. First day was a little bit, of, little bit frustrating. So what do we do with all this information uh, that we collect from all the camera traps? We share it with the world. Um, so we created World Okapi Day in 2016, which is October 18th this year. And uh, what's most important is we uh, work with the local communities to uh, inspire excitement and appreciation for Okapi while, while they're um, in the area. And so we work with local school children. We um, plan a bunch of activities for them to do in different villages. And we actually get zoos around the world to sponsor the activities in those villages because zoos love to celebrate all these World Animal Days, so we kind of do that, that connection with them. And so the, um, on, our staff on the ground created this sticker and t-shirts um, for World Okapi Day this past year, and it says, Protégeons l'Okapi, la fierte de l'IRDC, which means, let's protect Okapi, the fire of the DRC. And with that, I'm going to invite John back up to close. Thank you, Lucas. Just to inform everybody, I was just there and suffered the key episode the same way Lucas did. <laughs> so I left 25 snack bags with them, and I put cable lock key, camera key, and a number in each bag, and we practiced that. So I think next time we will not have that problem. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I just want to bring attention. We have a great team in the Congo. This is our team in Apulu. Uh, we, work, as we have a phenomenal group. Uh, one of the issues we have, and just we would love to have some of those people here at the, the expo, but we cannot get visas for Congolese citizens to the U.S. We've tried every year, and it's just not possible. I went to the U.S. Embassy last August and met with the people in the U.S. Embassy, asked, what can we do to get these people? They're sponsored, everything, they work for us. They just said that this is the number one country for people not going back on their visas in the, in the United States. So it's at the top of the list of countries, they do not want to let people in unless extraordinary circumstances. So it's really, really shame. We would love to have, we have great staff, great people you would love to meet, and they're just fantastic. And uh, so I, it's really just one of the issues we really have to suffer through working in this country. Uh, working in, and thank Lucas for that great presentation, but overall what we've been trying to do is use the Okapi. It got a place protected. It allows a really unique human culture to thrive. The pygmy culture is phenomenal culture. It's one of the oldest cultures on the planet. And we really, just letting them live the way they want to live is important to us. The grandmother teaching the young kids how to dance with their palm frond, that's something they got to be able to do for each generation. But also in this forest, there's tremendous diversity. Species that are threatened, pangolins, there's, all, there's bongo antelope, there's all kinds of species. There's animals and species we haven't even been described yet. There's, there's Inselbergs in this reserve that there's different species on the top of each Inselberg. Nobody knows what's there. It's just phenomenal diversity. So the Okapi is the reason we can be able to do this. It's a flagship. So, and now the support we get from WCN and all our donors makes this possible because uh, this is one of the best protected areas in a country that's very difficult to work in. But we are making progress. We are getting things done. And I really want to thank everyone uh, for your support. Thank you. <laughs>